I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm joining you from today, the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples. Um, and their elders past, present and emerging. It is very cold, as many of you know, on Ngunnawal country today, um, but uh, as always very beautiful and the rain has continued to bring out the frogs and, and the pollinators and other things. So that's a blessing. Um, I'm the knowledge broker for the Threatened Species Recovery Hub for uh, another week and a half. And, um, and I'm very pleased to be hosting this presentation today, um, talking to us about the um, Iconic Species in Schools project and this excellent pilot that has been run in Melbourne, um, which has been a great example of integrating traditional knowledge and um, Indigenous um, partners uh, with environmental knowledge and hands-on practice uh, and it's really had a powerful uh, effect in schools. So we'd love to talk to you about that project today and also about what next steps might look like. So I'm going to introduce our two speakers and um, they're going to take it from here. Uh, first up we have Natasha Ward and Natasha Ward has been really the driving force behind this project. Natasha is an educator and specialist in the integration of Indigenous knowledge into education and she um, has been working as part of the RMIT um, Interdisciplinary Conservation Science Group to um, to progress this project, and then we that will, uh, Natasha will be followed by Sarah Beckersy, who heads up the Icon Science Group and who has uh, who helped to initiate this project and, and make it a reality. So um, they're going to talk to us about this project today. Over to you, Natasha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just again, uh, my name is Natasha. Uh, I would like to start off as well by acknowledging the traditional custodians of land which I'm on. Uh, so I'm on Bungurung and Wadarurung kind of conflicted country. So I'll acknowledge both of the uh, groups there and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging uh, and also pay my respects to any other Indigenous people who are virtually joining us today and pay my respects to their elders. So I'm going to start off with sharing my screen. So I've been working on this project, like Rachel said, with Sarah about bringing respect for culture, significant species and traditional knowledge into schools. Um, so this project ran in 2019, unfortunately with COVID, we weren't able to replicate it again, but essentially we went out to a school and we did a term's worth of work with this group. So the entirety of term four science was dedicated to this project where we looked at embedding indigenous knowledges and biodiversity and conservation and all of that interesting biological sciences into the curriculum in a really holistic way where nothing felt like we were just doing a one-off session. Everything was inbuilt and of equal importance, all of the different knowledge systems that we used. So the aims of this project, we look to increase some the students' connections to nature through endangered systemic species. So we looked at a few different species and the main species that we looked at was the matted flax lily and the blue banded bee as endangered species that are also incredibly important to the traditional custodians of the land that the school was based on, which is the Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. We also really wanted to look at building respect and awareness for Indigenous knowledges. It's definitely an area which is important in the curriculum, but it can be quite hard to implement. And as it's something that is still relatively new, there seems to be a bit of hesitancy from some teachers on how to do this. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were incorporating those Indigenous knowledges into the school curriculum in a very holistic manner. Rather than it being a one-off session, it was embedded throughout every science lesson through the entire term. And finally, we wanted to develop a partnership between the school that we facilitated the program with, which was Carlton North Primary School, and with the traditional owners of that land. So through the Wurundjeri Wurrung, Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Cooperation, being able to develop a really strong partnership between the two to ensure that that would be able to develop 
be well beyond this project and continue. So the point of the project was that they were going to plant a garden by the end of it. So increasing that biodiversity and that garden would be filled with native species that were important to the traditional custodians and would also create a wonderful habitat within the school grounds for native species like bees and different pollinators and insects um, that would be able to live there and thrive, as well as just increasing the amount of green space within the schools, which Sarah will talk a lot more about, but will just increase the students' well-being and health in many different ways. So there's a few reasons why this is important. And this project was important, I guess, from three different ways. So we can talk about it from a curricular level, from like the Australian curriculum. You've got the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australians. And within that, it was a really big push for traditional knowledges to be embedded to help promote reconciliation within Indigenous and non-Indigenous students and future adults of our society. This uh, Melbourne Declaration has caused this really big push for Indigenous knowledges, which has filtered down into each of the state's curriculum. And in Victoria, it's become one of our cross-curricular priorities, and it's meant to be embedded in every single subject. The issue seems to be that there is a big gap in how we could embed it in every subject, and it's only been embedded for a couple of years now, and teachers seem to be very lost. That kind of brings me up to our second level, which is the teacher's confidence. If we talk about it from a department point of view, we've put it in there. The teachers feel a lack of confidence in actually developing any content or teaching any content. There seems to be a knowledge gap and a lack of resources for teachers. And teachers are very time poor in our schools. So it's quite hard for a lot of our teachers to spend the time creating lessons or curriculum that will fit within the Victorian and Australian curriculums to put within their schools. So this was really important in it being able to build up that teacher confidence and provide resources for the teachers. And there's also these health benefits of nature's in cities and increasing the amount of green space within schools. And then from, I guess, a personal level, this project was really, really important to myself as an Indigenous person who has gone through edu the education system without really experiencing any traditional knowledge or traditional education around Indigenous knowledges. I, my own personal experience was that I went through high school hearing about Indigenous uh, topics maybe twice and it typically was the stolen generation was all that I learnt about during high school. The content just wasn't there and as an Indigenous person it is a driving force in my own personal pedagogy is to increase the amount of Indigenous knowledges within science specifically as Indigenous peoples were the world's first scientists, some of the longest astronomers and navigators on this planet, I think that's really important knowledge that we can share with our non-Indigenous uh, community. It just, by being able to share this information, everybody grows, everybody gains something, and it increases the cultural and spiritual connection to the land of everybody involved. Um, so I mentioned before that we were looking at totemic species or species that were important to the Wurrung peoples. The main species that we looked at was the uh, matted flax lily, which is a beautiful little purple flower which you can see on the left. And it's absolutely stunning, but incredibly endangered. And the matted flax lily is one of the most important sources of food for the blue banded bee, which is one of our native bees. And I think one of our cutest bees with these beautiful blue stripes. Now, we need both of these species in our ecosystems, but unfortunately with the matted flax lily being so incredibly endangered, the blue banded bee is finding that it has less and less habitat to inhabit. So part of the project was that the students 
we're able to plant an Indigenous garden. And at the end of our planting, it, we believe it's actually the largest population of matted flaxily throughout the state of Victoria at this point in time, which is absolutely incredible and an incredible source of habitat for these blue banded bees and other native pollinators. So we went to this school for an incomplete term and it was really important for Sarah and myself when working through and developing this project that we put a really strong emphasis on embedding the Indigenous knowledges and the biodiversity knowledge in a really holistic way within the science curriculum. What this meant was that I was at the school um, nearly every week to help facilitate this content. We worked specifically with a lead teacher within the school to uh, develop the curriculum and make sure that everything we did had a really strong link to this biodiversity and to Indigenous knowledges. So we took at it from the view of we're going to finish up by making this garden let's learn everything that's going to lead up to a garden so we learned about seeds and taught the students how to make our scientific drawings and how we plant seeds now and also how we've traditionally planted seeds seeds using fire and farming and traditional farming of the land which was the next week we also had the students doing a lot of their own research rather than us trying to just give them information. We really wanted them to try and learn themselves and share that with each other. We learned a lot about ecosystems and we also tried to do some excursions and incursions. So we went to the Melbourne Museum where they have an absolutely incredibly, incredible native garden and we went around teaching the students about the traditional uses for the plants, their medical uses, their tool uses, how maybe they were eaten or used for fibre and getting the students just to really interact with our native species in a up close way where they would be able to learn as much as they could. Building on that, we also did an incursion. So going into the school where we showed them some different types of tools used by indigenous people of this land. So the Woiwurrung people for them, we also talked about how we could cook with these native ingredients. So the students absolutely loved being able to make some cookies with native ingredients, um, talking about things like cold burns, so traditional fire farming and how that is beneficial to the land. Just really trying to have a really rich uh, experience surrounding traditional knowledges. And then the students were able to plant their garden, which was really, really amazing. And the students took such personal interest and care into the garden that they created. Um, after everything had been built, the school did do a welcome to country and an open ceremony and had a Woiwurrung elder, Ani Dai, come out and welcome everyone to the uh new gardens and to the new facilities and it was a really beautiful moment where uh, the Woiwurrung elder Ani Dai was really emotional and really proud of everything that had been done talking about how we're increasing our biodiversity and talking about how we're increasing our Indigenous awareness as well as the students taking such great ownership over it. It was a really beautiful moment and I was honoured to be a part of it. Looking at it, so I'm going to talk a little bit more now about the Indigenous culture and knowledge exercise before I hand over to Sarah. So we did a pre and post survey when we facilitated this program and we found that uh, before the survey there was about 44% of students that were able to name the traditional owners of the land where they lived, which increased to over 80% afterwards and that alone is a really powerful number because so many adults don't know the traditional land that they're on so to see these students be able to be so proud to say who the land belonged to and who took care of this land was really impactful there was also an increase in understanding of that how much 
uh, the school would learn about Indigenous culture, Aboriginal culture. There was this really strong increase there. And also looking more about specific parts of Indigenous culture and the importance of plants. So the matted flaxily is not an important part of Indigenous culture. That was very much an increase into the next one where nearly every student said, that yes, it is an important part of Indigenous culture and they understood why these plants were important as well. Part of it was also planting this Indigenous, uh, this matted flax lily, so they would be able to understand more of the ecological standpoint of how one individual plant could make a difference into an ecosystem. So that it, if the matter flexibility disappeared, it would make a difference to other plants and animals and being able to plant it at the school. So now all the students were able to see that the matter flexibility was near where they were living in their school grounds. And we had a few students actually say that they wanted to grow some of these native plants at home post learning about it over the term. And that was a really beautiful moment. Um, and again, more from that. I guess, biodiversity and importance of our ecosystems perspective, looking at the matted flaxily, but also just nature in general. These students really believe that everybody must protect nature. Um, and I think that's really powerful because this is our next generation. These are the people who are young. These will be our young adults and these will be our policy makers and these will be our future. So it was really beautiful to see just the passion in these students that, yes, everybody needs to help to protect nature. And yes, these plants do have the same right to exist as people do. People are not more important than these plants. And if these plants disappeared, they genuinely would care. So seeing these students reclaim the sense of identity when it comes to nature and our traditional owners and, and their knowledge systems and also just the way that they connected with nature. It was just really uplifting and inspiring to see and see how that changed over the course of the program. So that is my little uh, discussion about how this program, how it was actually run within the school and also I guess more of a focus on the Indigenous perspectives of it as an Indigenous woman that was definitely where I was able to contribute the most information to but I'm going to pass over to Sarah. Sarah is absolutely incredible uh, and we'll be able to talk a lot more about the biodiversity and the ecological perspectives as to why this project was so important. Well thanks Tash. Um, I'll try and be pretty quick so that we can have uh, lots of uh, time for discussion, but I, I too will just quickly share my screen. Um, hoping everyone can see that. Is that okay, Rachel? Yes, you're good. Okay. Yeah, so look, firstly, I would really like to thank Rachel um, and also Brad Mogridge and other uh, members of the Threatened Species Hub who kind of supported us all the way on, the, on this project. And, and the other members of the team, so Tash, the teacher of the school, Ben, um, many others who were just absolute stars and was a, were privileged to, to work with in this project. I'm actually really quite thrilled to present on this um, project. It's certainly been my most, I think, rewarding research project that I've worked on. And I think I've, I've probably got a few up there that are really great, but this one <laughs> really tops it. Um, it, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start actually just by showing you the newly minted um, acknowledgement of country from the school that we we worked with uh, in 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 Carlton North, a very kind of um, city based um, concrete jungle sort of school I suppose, uh, and before the project um, had I would say uh, pretty limited engagement with uh, with uh, you know traditional knowledge and, and indigenous culture. But uh, over the last couple of years, I've been very proud to see the steps this, the school has taken, uh, including obviously having a beautiful acknowledgement of country that I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which we teach, learn and play. 
pay our deepest respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, emerging, for they hold the memories, traditions and hopes of Aboriginal Australians. This land is, was and will always be Aboriginal land. And every child at Carlton North Primary actually knows how to say that uh, acknowledgement by heart. Um, in this talk, briefly, I want to, I suppose, tell you a bit about what motivated me to kind of kick this project off. Um, I, I, I like to sort of reiterate a few of the kind of quite uh, profound results that, that Tash has touched on. And then I'd really like to open up some discussion about, you know, how we move something like this, such an effective um, and an evidence-based now pilot study uh, into, into the future. So I think there are two key motivations for me. One is that I have worked for quite a long time in my research career thinking about how we bring nature back into cities as a way of addressing you know, some of the unprecedented challenges that cities face. We know that we have fires, you know, floods, cyclones, heat waves. They're a normal part of city life now. How we ensure that people have clean air, clean water, how we keep people healthy, happy, connected, you know, stress-free in the face of, um, you know, exponential population growth and COVID pandemics and, you know, and just the anxiety, I think, that comes with climate change and biodiversity, um, you know, extinction crises and the like. And planners are really genuinely interested in how we can solve some of these kind of challenging questions and turning more and more to the idea that nature has to be a key part of the solution. We know that nature in cities is really uh, very effective at, at, at cooling, at reducing the risk of kind of uh, extreme weather events impacting on people's lives, at creating those everyday nature experiences that we all probably needed so desperately in COVID lockdowns, for, for those of you kind of ex who experienced it. I mean, I suppose perhaps Tash and I, as the um, Victorians in the room, <laughs> know it better than well, anyone else in the world, I suppose. But there were people who had nature around them and people who didn't during COVID lockdowns. And there was a very big uh, environmental justice issue, I think, that arose um, in recognition of that difference. The health benefits alone um, uh, are sort of, I think they're compelling enough without anything else being on the, on the table. The fact that if you live in a street with more biodiversity, you'll have less incidence of less likelihood of having, you know, heart disease, diabetes and cancer, you know, intriguing, really, that you will sleep better, you'll have less incidence of kind of mental uh, well-being issues, there'll be less crime. Um, obviously, that sense of place and, and identity is, is, is a huge aspect that planners are really interested in. Your kids, if they play in a school with more biodiversity, will have improved cognitive functioning and reduced problems with um, behavioural issues like ADHD. I mean, these kinds of things are the sorts of uh, evidence-based benefits that politicians and planners are, are very much listening to. Um, and this is let alone the kind of financial and economic benefits, if you like, of things like uh, retail street productivity or activity going up. Um, if you have nature in the street, workplaces, being more productive, less sick leave. The, the, uh, every day there's more and more kind of evidence that this is a kind of a compelling way to be building our cities. So it's absolutely apparent to me that at the same time as, as doing all of this nature in cities, we have a massive opportunity to build knowledge, respect and capacity for caring for country in the city uh, and caring and, and respect for Indigenous culture. Um, and, you know, in many other aspects of our work, we are sort of uh, trying to sort of uh, move this agenda forward, that Indigenous people have a key role to play in the design, the implementation, the monitoring, the governance, the management, um, urban range of programs, urban caring for country plans, I think are going to be definitely a very big thing of the future. And they're already starting to happen, of course. And it's no brainer to me that schools should be key sites to bring nature back in our cities uh, and celebrating Indigenous culture uh, and, and building respect in this way. School yards and school grounds, even if you just want to look at the biodiversity benefits, are a very big opportunity that I think we're currently missing for conservation of threatened species. I have a second motivation here that I have to declare. These are my kids when they were quite a bit younger now in a grassland on the outskirts of Melbourne, but they've now both uh, been to primary school uh, and perhaps it's a little bit selfish of me, but I looked at the education that they were receiving uh, around Indigenous cult culture and knowledge 
and realised that it wasn't much better than the education that I received as a child, which um, I look back on in the same way that Tash probably does and feel, you know, really uh, quite appalled. And I remember it was the day that my daughter came home, they were doing a cultural uh, history walk of Carlton. And I, I was looking at the material that they had and realised that the history of Carlton apparently ended when, when uh, you know, with European history. And I just thought, this is not good enough. We cannot keep doing this in this country. This is why we have still um, ongoing problems, um, you know, with, with, with reconciliation. And, and besides which, why deny our children the opportunity to learn from a culture that's managed to live sustainably in this place for, you know, thousands of years? Um, and, you know, as Tash mentioned, the agricultural knowledge, the the engineering knowledge, the astronomy knowledge, uh, the land management knowledge. I mean, these are all things that we're currently kind of denying our, our children access to, if you like. Um, so they they were really my two key motivations, if I have to be honest. And Tash has described the project. We uh, had funding from the national from the National Environment Science Program and also the state government of Victoria to to buy out a bit of the teachers' time. I, I must say the project budget is very modest and I can tell anyone in detail about the about that uh, if, if you're interested but we brought out some of the time of a, of a teacher we obviously paid the uh, tr traditional owners and, and a young traditional owner to be um, involved uh, an elder and a younger person to be involved in the in the project um, and then also Tash obviously utterly critical um, has been the kind of really key driving force of this of this project and we were we worked with Uncle Dave Wonden from uh, the Wurundjeri um, Wurrung Aboriginal um, uh, Council to identify a totem species for the school. So this idea that we are going to teach the children about the species um, and get them to appreciate perhaps like a more spiritual dimension to conservation that I think we don't talk enough about. The idea that you know if you look after it, it's going to look after you. Um, and you know I suppose in my Heart of hearts, I was kind of hoping for something like a frog or a bird, <laughs> maybe a lizard. Um, but we chose a plant and I thought, well, crikey, if we can make this work with a kind of uh, <laughs> a grassland plant, then I reckon we can probably do it with any old species at all. Um, sorry, sorry, Uncle Dave. But they're really, I suppose, the, the nuts and bolts of it were that we were trying to achieve three key things in this project to increase respect for uh, as respect and knowledge of indigenous culture to increase knowledge of threatened species and and also um, of ecology how you create habitat um how, you know things like connectivity and resources and like and then how you care and an increase in care for threatened species in nature more broadly um, oh, that was just another image of the another impact of uh, of urban vegetation, where we just can see the massive cooling difference that we can have with having vegetation in a really hot streetscape. The other aspect to this project, of course, was just engaging people, engaging children, in re-enchanting people with the very idea of nature through these kinds of experiences. And I think that's something that we probably I, I feel like we achieved um, really, really uh, effectively. Oops, sorry, I'm going backwards rather than forwards. Okay, um, so Natasha has kind of uh, presented a few of the results. I'm just going to quickly reiterate. We worked with the matted, matted flax lily, this you know really critically endangered species, less than four, 14,000 plants left in the world, um, only 100 plus locations, most of them around Melbourne, and a lot of them still being impacted. We know that the North East Link Freeway, for example, is going to probably take out one of the last big intact populations. So a very currently threatened, critically endangered species. Now to evaluate the success of the program, one of the things that we had to do was to develop a kind of survey instrument. And look, uh, Tash uh, uh, and others in, in Icon Science, we, we spent a long time trying to work out if there are existing instruments we could use. And it's, um, it's actually kind of strange in, in some respects, but we couldn't find um, a, a, a cultural awareness survey designed for children. So we actually had to design one for the project. And, the, and the, so the survey really had a bunch of elements. It was about connection to nature, enjoyment of nature, empathy for nature, a sense of you know oneness, um, a sense of responsibility. But it was also about cultural, um, you know, enjoyment of other cultures, knowledge of uh, other cultures, and particularly knowledge of the totem species itself and care for it. 
um, responsibility and agency and, and how much they were likely to sort of share their knowledge with others. So it was quite a comprehensive, a bit like a kind of cultural awareness survey, but really designed with questions that children could understand. Some of the questions um, really had quite clear ceiling effects. So kids at Carlton North Primary really enjoy talking to and playing with and learning about traditions and lifestyles from other people and cultures. So, so high in the first, in pre-program that really it's kind of called a classic ceiling effect, unlikely to see any, any changes because it was too high to start with. This is a good thing. Um, but other things, um, recognising that the, the, the school had kind of, uh, had cared about and, and uh, emphasised Aboriginal culture really increased quite dramatically post-program doubling the number of kids who knew about the traditional owners of where they lived. Lots of really deep knowledge about the Mataflaxili itself, uh, how, it, how it grows. It's obviously a, a member of an equally endangered ecosystem, this uh, volcanic plains grassland, uh, which you also have around, um, around Canberra. It's pollinated by this very charismatic bee that head bangs the flowers to, uh, to knock the pollen out. Um, it requires, you know, really... Um, this is Uncle Dave in action here at Mary, Mary Creek uh, doing a cool burn and he, having him describe to the kids how to do a cool burn was one of the most beautiful experiences that, that he would stand in the fire as he is here, um, that it was cool enough so he could actually watch how the animals responded to the fire. Like he could see the, you know, that, he, that there were some lizards that crawled up his legs, but others kind of, you know, climbed into cracks in the clay. And, and just that sort of description of fire, not as a threatening process, but as a renewal process, I think was really beautiful. And actually a lot of the kids are very keen to have him back to burn their <laughs> grassland at the school sometime soon, which will be really fun. It helped that one of the grandparents of the school was actually Bruce Pascoe, who was an amazing asset to have in this program. And he you know, so there was a natural emphasis on um, the idea that agricultural, um, Aboriginal agriculture is a really sort of, uh, you know, incredible knowledge system that we, we can learn so much from in this country. Knowledge of the matter flaxley itself increased dramatically. Um, we planted, you know, the, the, it's a, as I said, it's a concrete jungle, this school. There's only synthetic turf, really, and, and a bluestone and bluestone garden beds. But with what we had, we still managed to plant out um, probably we think is what the biggest kind of single population of Mataflax in, in the state now. Um, people cared about post-program about Mataflax disappearing um, and through, you know, Tasha's good work uh, had sort of really extraordinary knowledge of the, the uses of plants uh, in different contexts. Did you know the Mataflax Lee can be used to deter snakes through creating a little whistle? For example, the kids loved that. Um, we went to the museum. That was a fantastic uh, uh, experience. Uh, understanding the links to Indigenous culture and in the fact that we really, that, that you know, the Mataflax Lee is a key part of that, uh, of that culture. Um, and that Mataflax Lee has the same right to exist that people do. So the quality of information was probably the richest and most beautiful to read about, um, in part because we had sort of, I had never really seen how much kids now of these days use um, emoticons to express their feelings in, uh, in surveys. Um, I thought this Indigenous Garden Project was a lot of fun, we had a lot to learn about, lots of many different species and plant multiple plants. Um, I never knew about Matterflax Lee, it was going extinct, and now I'm planning to plant some in my backyard. I think making an Indigenous garden was an excellent idea. I learnt loads that they're critically endangered. It's awesome to think that our school has one of the world's biggest populations of matted flax lilies. I really enjoy this project. I think it's really important for young children to learn about these things at a young age. Very mature comment there. I feel as if it will fizzle out. It was short and a bit rushed, but I did learn a lot. I would like to do more on this and wish we did it for longer. Definitely do this next year and the year after. Cute. In the Indigenous project, I learned a lot about various things. I'm very glad we did this project. I think everybody expanded their knowledge on Indigenous gardening. And this one, beautiful, I, from a year six girl. I really enjoyed science this term. I feel much closer to Indigenous culture than I ever have. And I think that, that, that kind of idea that this was a really effective way of teaching science was something that I feel is very compelling 
having you know Western and traditional science kind of um, discussed in the same curriculum material, I think was really compelling and fun. It was so fun planting the plants. Every kid named their particular matter of black silly, so they kind of looked after them. Um, this is yeah. So this is this is the garden kind of grown on the, uh, the year after, and it's a it's a beautiful, really sensory kind of place now. So you know, I suppose in in summary, I think we've it's kind of rare. Probably all the educators in the room will know this to have detailed information about the performance of a program but we now have evidence that we were successful in all the areas that we set out to deliver on respect for indigenous culture knowledge of threatened species and ecology care of threatened species and of nature in general um, but there's some bonus of extras you know enjoyment of science i hadn't really appreciated that that's something that could uh, be enhanced through a project like this but it definitely was plus you know we've created habitat for a critically endangered species and all the co-benefits to the kids this place, this school will be cooler. You know, the kids will be, have potentially improved cognitive development and lower cases of behavioural issues. Um, it's healthier, et cetera. Um, and the school itself is now going on a journey with embedding cultural um, uh, respect and knowledge, you know, through the curriculum, They're doing a wrap, for example, uh, embedding knowledge in a much deeper way. And the teachers, I think, have got much more confidence in teaching this material. So there's so much left to do in this project, but we've, you know, run out of money, if I have to put it kind of bluntly. Um, we've got this a pilot. It's been effective. I just think it's a total no-brainer that we should be trying to roll this out. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we do this. From my perspective, there's so much research left to do. You know, we had Indigenous and non-Indigenous kids in, this, in these classrooms. How did they both... Um, React to the material and 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 learn. Um, what's the what's what's the broad impact on cultural journeys, for example? Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, um, I feel like you know this is this is the kind of program that can build the sort of uh, the the you know foundations I think for for reconciliation that our country kind of really needs.